also quite, uh, let's say, appealing, I think, uh, because of the subject, Rome. Rome is such a fantastic topic. And I've tested some of the content, if you want, from this particular lecture, presentation, or seminar, or sharing, or laboratory, whatever you want to call it, with some of the students at Harvard. And there, too, it has been really well received. So what are the main, if you want, uh, trends, or work on the main, say, uh, ideas that I'm going to put in First of all, starting from the, from the title, The Constructing Rome, well, I'm invoking or evoking the ghost of the construction. At the same time, you know, when you talk about a city, a city is inevitably constructed, i.e. built up, and in a sense applying deconstruction in a really broad sense, it's also quite, let's say, tempting and feasible. So nothing too technical, in a sense, but also, you know, with an attempt to look at some, if you want, theoretical thinking about the city, and also, what I would like to do with you, as well as presenting basically two films in the end, I decided to narrow down to two phenomenal, beautiful, phenomenal, beautiful films that have come out recently, exactly in the same year, one great beauty and the other one, perhaps lesser well known, um, Gianfranco Rossi's Sacro Gra. Now, together with these two films, I want to touch upon, I don't know how much we will manage to do given time constraints, but I'm interested to touch on the idea of city theory as compared and applied to nation theory, especially when it comes to something that is really accompanying us and has been accompanying us for far too long, perhaps, and that's a discourse on Italy. I think that the, these things coming together are pretty explosive, and I hope that we go out without exploding, but you know, having shared perhaps something valuable and interesting. So starting from, I said, deconstruction. Deconstruction for me is something actually very applicable. Um, people say that you know, Jacques Derrida give, gives them, I don't know, something like you know, a rash in the skin. Well, it can be irritating, but it can also eye-opening. And the eye-opening that uh, I think Derrida can do for us, and in general deconstruction can do for us, it's, it's inviting us to look perhaps at some of the dichotomies, some of the discontinuities, to find that actually in the discontinuities you find incredible continuities. And at the same time, you can open up new avenues. When finally, you know, having indulged perhaps in some incredible uh, acrobatics uh, intellectually, uh, 
uh, in dissemination, uh, Derrida arrives at the point where he states, you know, Platon c'est moi, well, there, I think, he gets red-handed or caught red-handed, and it's nice for us to know that someone has deeply devoted to the deconstructing of Western metaphysics is also arriving at some interesting literary thinking that is very close to some of the things that we do in our courses, in our daily life as professionals. So deconstructing alone will have something, but very little of this. At the same time, as I said, I promised I'm going to look at some of the theoretical thinking about the city and the nation in tandem. Why? Because city theory is very, very agile, flexible, and developing fast just now. More than 50% of the global, uh, global mankind is urbanized, and so the interest from scholars in, let's say, quasi scholars and people uh, working in other areas, non professional areas, is increasing around the city. The city is becoming a phenomenon and phenomenon, global phenomenon, and in a sense, it's losing some of its specificity when it comes to the culture that produced it. Even though cities are resilient and continuing to be attached to a very specific culture, at the same time as a phenomenon, they're studied more and more, let's say, globally. And it's interesting how all definitions such as, you know, the classifications, the typical classifications for cities were, say, by size, by density, by diversity, and that was sometimes, that was it. Now it's become a lot more imaginative by adopting concepts and definitions such as the imaginative city, the dark city, the arrival city, and so on and so forth. And in that, I would find a place for Rome as, let's say, not just the foundational city, not just an imperial city, but also an emotional city. And that takes me to one of my first points, and that is when we talk about Rome, it's amazing how much outpouring of love there is about this place. And it may come from, say, uh, local Italian culture, but also, you know, and even more so by and from visitors. And this applies to scholars as much as to the general, say, you know, the less experienced tourist. I can think, for instance, of a beautiful book such as Mike Herzfeld, Evicted from Eternity, published in 2009, is professor of anthropology at Harvard, and proposing to us to look specifically and very technically about one phenomenon that uh, concerns an area of Rome, the eviction of people from the particular area in order to basically beautify it, gentrify it, relaunch it. At the same time, in the paratexts accompanying this particularly uh, rich and technical book, there is a lot of that, as I said, outpouring of feeling for Rome, an explanation of why, as a scholar, one comes to basically working of, on Rome for a lifetime. It's a lifetime enterprise. And so on and so forth. You could look, for instance, you could observe some of our observers. I'm talking about uh, media people, journalists. I'm thinking in particular of someone like Bill Emmett from the UK, who has devoted a part of his profession, professional activities, to the studying and depicting and discussing and debating with. And I don't know if you're familiar with a film entitled A Girlfriend in a Coma. Yes, of course. Girlfriend in a Coma came out in 2015. It's directed by Annalisa Pires. It's not meant for the you know, sort of big cinema uh, venue, but it's meant for circulation within, say, the medias, i.e. especially television uh, channels. And it is, once again, a very personal take by someone who has dealt with or handled or tackled the issue of Italy, especially today, not just Rome, but Italy today, from the perspective of having been a sort of English boyfriend, if you want, of Italy, given that the title of the film, Girlfriend in a Coma, is pointing in that direction. And in order to justify, almost, and give himself authority over this particular task, i.e. depicting the Italy of Berlusconi, primarily, but not exclusively, uh, what's left of it, basically, after the Berlusconi's left office, we do have the sense that in order to justify and gain authority on a public that could question how come that Italy needs you know, an English boyfriend in order to survive, well, basically, it comes from personal experience. And once again, we've got you know, the full commitment, the full statement coming from Bill Emmett beginning of the film, explaining why he's committed to this nightly quest, it could be put that way. 
And so having, in a sense, used his capitati benevolentis to establish that there is a particular link between himself and Italy, so he's not someone who dares speak without a direct experience of the country, is also saying, you know, it is an act of love, and it's through an act of love that I'm denouncing the evil. Even though the film is organized around two main halves, Buona Italia, Mal Italia, I would say that the Mal Italia plays the shocking part inevitably, I mean, evil is a lot more shocking than goodness. Um, at the same time, the shocking part of it is really shocking, and some people, you know, do find that the approach has been far too forceful. If we want to discuss that at some point later, because this is part and parcel of this vision of Rome <coughs> as double bound with Italy, is part of the intention of the talk for tonight. So when it comes to city theory, I'm finding that the field is flexible, it's very adaptable, it's very interested in what's happening just now at the global level is a lot less cultural specific, and that's a pity in a sense, because the city do specialize. And in specializing, especially as they have specialized in Italy over time, consider the Grand Tour. The Grand Tour was attracting people according to where you wanted to go geographically, i.e. your experience of Italy, was in a sense marketed through, if you can call it market, was marketed through your expectation of what you would find in Venice, compared to Naples, compared to Rome, compared to Florence, which were possibly the major ground to towns, with changes over time, obviously, as technology allowed you to travel further south more easily. So with city specialization, you would like some of this to be retained in what is global city thinking. Uh, the general thinking is extremely positive. Titles such as The Triumph of the City or Cities Are Good For You are all, you know, the rage in a sense of serious scholarliness. At the same time, at the same time, there is, I think, a strong uh, risk, if you want to put it that way, I don't want to sound alarmistic, but that some of the cultural specificity, especially when it comes to Italy, does it have a particularly strong city culture, you know, we do have something of a risk. And it may not be by chance that Italian cities, in a sense, don't figure out that much in uh, uh, the analysis, if you want, of some of the living scholars. I'm thinking also, for instance, something like that beautiful atlas of cities produced by Paul Knox just last year. I generally tend to think about something fairly recent in terms of publications. I think it's nice to present something that is really relevant and contemporary and sort of ready for discussion now because it has just been picked from the Harvard bookstore the other day. So John, uh, Paul Knox, Paul Knox's book, The Atlas of City, thin, thick, beautifully produced, phenomenally beautifully produced, divides cities according to this more flexible classification I was referring to. You know, more imaginative, more creative, enterprising in terms of, you know, what you bring to bear in terms of the attributes of the city that you want to classify. Well, Italian cities don't figure out that much, and Rome, as I said, figures only as the foundational city, which is surprising to me, whereas I would have also placed it under emotional city, for instance. That would have been, to me, almost owed <coughs> to something that has been so much loved over time. When I start thinking about nation theory, uh, inevitably, most of the discussion on Italy, sorry, on, on, on cities such as Rome, will bring in Italy in some way or other. And vice versa, when you talk about Italy, the talk will come about Rome. So there is this double bind, once again, between nation and that particular city, which obviously has played a very major part <coughs> in the Italian Risorgimento. And not just in the Risorgimento as such, but if you want in the entire movement or convulsion of energies and feverishness that is basically you know, the preparation for that unification that was so belated. I'm thinking here about, again, some beautiful films that can give us the sense or remind us very vaguely of what it must have been like to be Italian without having a, an Italy or a state to refer to and what it meant to aspire to something that had been failing us, or we have been failing it for far too long. And I'm thinking here about, again, two fairly recent beautiful films that go in tandem, even though they come from a different director, and they do not, do not belong together. But in terms of the period that they are portraying to us, they do belong together. And these are Noi Credevamo by Mario Martone, 2010, and the other one is Vincere by Marco Bellocchio, 2009. 
two really splendid films. And to me, the continuity there and the one that I would like to put to you as part of, if you want, the problem, the gateway, is basically the feverishness, the convulsion, the fact that the generations were spent, as we see, especially in the Martone film, the first film that you have mentioned, generations are spent in this state of convulsion. State of convulsion is almost, again, you know, one denying the other. Well, it's actually extremely serious if you only live by convulsion, but this is what appears to be the case. Now, I'm pitching things very lightly here, I know, but in a sense, what I'm trying to sort of put across to you is the fact that when you speak about Rome, you've got to speak about Italy, and when you speak about Italy, you've got to speak about Rome more than for any other city. Okay, there is the, if you want, the annexation, it's not annexation as such, but technically speaking, but let's say of Trent and Trieste, which for us were ultimately the last war of independence and led us to entering the war in, 2015, sorry, in uh, 1915, World War I. There are those territorial issues still attached, if you want to the idea of nation, but there is nothing more closely linked as Rome and Italy. And in the continuing discourse on Italy, you cannot but talk about Rome. And that too, in a sense, is problematic, because as I hinted at some problems at the level of theory, if you want, with city, there is similarly a problem at the level of nation. Nations are very much out of fashion, quite rightly so. We do find issues with them. Now, the problem is that Italy, in the pre-early modern period, invented most of the modernity we enjoyed, or um, a lot of it. At the same time, it did not enjoy or participate fully in that process that ensued or followed from those inventions. <coughs> One of those inventions, if you want, is Machiavelli. We can talk about it later at some point. But basically, Italy set up the tone of modernity, but was, in a sense, not fit for execution or for, uh, as I said, benefiting from those inventions. So whereas the rest of Europe was finding stability within, if you want, the uh, no, I'm losing, I'm not hitting the right word here. But anyway, uh, you know, by, by building land mass, Italy was not. And it's interesting how now, looking back at issues of nation, Italy could be at the forefront of a new global thinking about, you know, the alternative to nationhood. But unfortunately, when we thought, when we think about Italy today, we are still applying that one measure of failure. And I think that that too, might be an interesting way to provoke a new form of debate in order not to always measure up Italy against, if you want, the yardstick of nationhood and nation, and nation state. By the way, the two things ultimately do go well together somehow, because the nation shouldn't be the same thing as state. Indeed, we call it the nation state to distinguish the two things. But in reality, when you talk about nation, the people who are native together, who belong together, somehow it does bring in, you know, something that is a judgment or an evaluation of the Italian state. The Italian state end up to, ends up to be or to look like, you know, an image, a spitting image of what is bad, in Bill Emmett's term, about the Italian people, what is not rescuable, what is not being remedied over time, and vice versa. So once again, the double bind is fairly close. And a further double bind that is particularly dangerous is the idea that you know either there is Rome at the center of this proliferating mess, or if there is death. If we think about the national anthem, and then I'll move on to my clips, which are the next stage. Um, if we think about the national anthem, I'm always struck by the idea that Italy was enslaved to Rome by God himself. It's a powerful line. However rhetorical, however marked by the time in which <coughs> the anthem, which was not yet the anthem when it was written, you know, there is a particular context, if you want, determining the rhetoric and the sentiments behind the rhetoric. All of that is absolutely justifiable, but the link between che Dio, la crea, serva, di Roma, it's quite interesting. One of the things Italy, or the Italians by extension, are accused of is a general or a kind of sloth, a kind of not just mulizia, not just softness, and not just corruptibility, but also a kind of inertia when it comes you know, to 
de deciding your own destiny. One could say, and it has been said, and it is extremely well argued in the literature, that Italy has you know, been basically enslaved for a very long time, at least since the early modern period. But if you look at the history of the, of the Roman culture, of the Roman Empire, you could say that actually that time extends a lot longer. And so that enslavement, which is technically correct, I mean, Italy was enslaved to Rome. It was conquered, ultimately, even though we are not thinking in those colonial terms exactly for that kind of Italy at the time of the Roman expansion. That could also explain parts, partly the dependence, partly, you know, the, I don't want to say love-hatred relationship between country and capital, but how, in a sense, Italy had to be recentered in order to have an identity at all. It had to be recentered on this center that was not yet part of the United Italy until 1871. So we're talking about a necessity that is more strongly so because of a long and long, long influential Far, influential for far too long kind of presence of Rome in the Italian mentality. What is the connection with these two films? If we can now. <coughs> La Grande Bellezza. One of the questions that one also asks in city theory is what is a city for? Rome is the third most visited city in Europe. And it doesn't need to start now, but we need to start at some point. It's the third most visited city in Europe after London and Paris, interestingly. Interestingly also of the many thousand, <coughs> many, many thousand visitors a day, bringing the density per square mile you know, to rather amazing figures. Also, the people visiting Rome are only staying in Rome for two and a half days, on average. And of these two, two and a half days, actually, the nights needed you know, to spend that time in Rome are actually spent outside the very narrow, let's say, historical center, or very small historical center that counts as the area that people want to see. And that's interesting also. You know, a book like this one, for instance, is trying to establish Rome postmodern narrative of a cityscape edited by Dom, Dom Holdaway and Filippo Trentini in 2013, another recent interesting title, um, is, is establishing exactly you know, the territories of, let's say, current interest for Rome, and obvious, obviously how Rome has failed to meet the postmodern requirements of missing on its center, on sprawling out into uh, dissolution of its center. Its center is still particularly strong, but the argument the two writers in the question are, are putting to us is that in reality, there are pockets of development in Rome that allow you to think of Rome in exactly those postmodern terms. So there is nothing actually that Rome fails or doesn't have compared to other stronger competitors when it comes to the urban sprawl. At the same time, in actual fact, people who, go to, who do go to Rome are still going to, you know, to view certain so when one thinks about the immense success of a film such as The Great Beauty, one question is, what is the city for? What is the film for? And what are its aspirations? Quite clearly, this film is for the world audience. Quite clearly, there is a strong homage to a film in the Italian history of cinema that has really made it for Italian cinema, and that is La Dolce Vita by Fellini has been stated, and I don't think that here we're hitting anything particularly new, we may decide, and the discussion has been, as to whether this particular film actually deserves the comparison, and whether you know, it deserves the Oscar. Uh, leaving that aside, and leaving the fact that uh, Servillo is one of the most fantastic uh, actors of the time, and hence you know, he brings this amazing ability to work with the persona of the character he's uh, acting to such an extent that he makes the film, as he did make, for instance, obviously, uh, another Paolo Sorrentino's film, Il Divo, of 2008. Of this particular film, I've selected one scene, because in a sense I want to work with the tools I'm used to working, and in a sense share them with you, just to show the kind of work that I like to do, 
and also to draw some of the general, let's say, principles or theories that are offered for discussion. And uh, it is the opening scene. And I suspect that even though it will have struck you, it's not what is most striking to you or more memorable for you of the film. I think we might want to lower the lights a bit. Uh, is that? I mean, you know that it is Rome, by definition, you are also the Janiculo, there are the signs, you know. You have been given some pointers and some markers. There is no way the bus driver could be read as nothing as other as Roman, and so on and so forth. But generally speaking, 
if this is beauty, the beauty you can die for, if this is Stendhal syndrome revisited, it, after all the poor guy does drop dead, well, this is also perhaps not worth dying for. Because what you're seeing, what is taking photographs, is, you know, it's really pretty fuzzy. Where is the beauty? Isn't it elusive? <coughs> at the same time, let's look at the composition of the fountain area. You do have this magnificent structure, architectural, but also watery, and you do have nine women. These nine women are turning their back onto the human scene, if you want us now. They are like, you know, three by three of the weaving fates of life, and they're singing. Now, the mystery about the singing is that it's pretty, you know, you cannot distinguish quite clearly what the singing is about. If you do research, and thankfully we do have the web, it does come out that the piece that they are singing was commissioned by a vocal ensemble from California, female only, and it was commissioned, and the composer there is David Lang, and the piece is called I Lie, and it's in Yiddish. And what they're singing is basically about not just the longing for the future, but the expectation, the waiting. Now, these are women that are turning their back to the tourist scene. They are within the scene. They are not like a soundtrack imposed onto the scene. They are part of the narrative, if you want. And there is a kind of confrontation between the individual tourist who forsakes the protection, if you want, of the tourist group. After all, he has moved away. And the guide, who happens to be female, looks aside in reproachful terms, and having moved out of the pack that could protect him, you know, and take him on to the next stop, you know, the next tourist viewpoint, instead he dares take photos of this fuzzy nothing that is Rome out there. Fuzzy because what is the beauty? What is beauty? What is Italy? How do you capture it? At the same time, the two backs you know, the back of the tourist taking photographs and the back of the women are talking, in a sense. They are refusing to consent, to give life. They deliver death, ultimately. This expectation coming from femininity and womanhood, I would say, is telling. The girl singing, the one that is also framed with Rome in the background, the particularly beautiful voice, I've never, never, never heard. I've searched again, you know, on YouTube to see and on other recordings, how much there is, you know, how many performances of this there are. And there aren't that many, but what there is is not as beautiful as this in terms of vocal rendering, let alone, you know, the context that Sorrentino then creates for it. But the combination of the two, I think, is particularly powerful. The woman is framed with, again, this fuzzy beauty to the back. She's singing her heart out, if you want, as she is also fate. And in being fate, she's waiting. Now, isn't this Italy? Donna Italia, always in tears, always waiting for something, always predicting misfortune, always in tatters, always to be rescued, possibly by an English boyfriend, as we said earlier, possibly <laughs> by some other boyfriend at some other point. Isn't that, again, in itself, you wouldn't expect this scene to have that connotation, because we do expect this film to be about you know, a kind of Dolce Vita lifestyle that is suitable for, say, for an American public, for a global public, that what expects, you know, to be emotional about that when it comes to Italy is visiting Italy and going back with enough, if you want, commercialized, packaged Rome to expose, if you want, to put on your beautiful library shelves when you were an aristocrat. Nowadays, it's a question of having something nice that reminds you of the trip. And that's your experience of Rome. This is what this film could be about. In reality, it has got in it some of the subtext is particularly, I think, deep reaching. But the clues were there. That famous, well, sorry, famous not, that scene that I pointed out, you know, when the camera is looking for the story to pick. And it's moving about the Gianicolo, the Passeggiato del Gianicolo, picking, you know, the historical references, the busts, the historical, if you want, memorabilia, you know, Italy is not just the Roman past, not just the classical past, not just the imperial past, it's actually, and above all, the risorgimental past. Mm -hmm. And so you do get the sense, you know, when you come to the equestrian statue of Garibaldi, and you do read on the pedestal, O Roma Morte, there you are. Then you know that someone, somehow, is going to die, I suspect, or perhaps you can read it backwards later, once you do have your body on the floor. And the body on the floor is actually fairly close to where it all takes place. And I think that this, in itself, it's a nugget of content that I want to keep for my next bed. 
My next bit is instead coming in the form of, and now I switch to, uh, to this one. Yeah. This is a much less well-known film. Highly recommendable. Really highly enjoyable. <coughs> As it says on the box, allow me to read, especially after it won Il Leone d'Oro and uh, Il Festival Internazionale di Venezia. Un film meraviglioso, Le Monde. Applausi a scena aperta, Corriere della Sera, bellissimo e commovente, emotional. Sacro Gra ha stregato Venezia. So there is always a mesmerizing, the power of the emotions. I suspect that whether we are observing Italy or anything that has got to do with Italy from outside or from within, we've always got emotions high on our mind. And I'm not blaming, and we're not just the ones to be blamed for this part in, if you want, the conversation. I think that actually emotions come from all parties involved. And here, before I launch into the Sacro Gra, I would like to say one more thing. When I think about something like this little booklet, uh, if you don't know it, I recommend it. It's a series of readings. Uh, again, it came out in 2014. Very enjoyable, uh, very predictable in some respects. All the common places that you would want to face when thinking about Rome are there, starting from the, the opening description, in which you do have Rome compared to an endless <coughs> sunset, in which you are actually placed almost as at the pole, because at the pole, perhaps, you know, sunsets are really, really long, but it's an in interminable agony, a baroque, arctic agony. You never stop dying. And if you think about how, for instance, Fellini or other you know, great artists of Rome have depicted Rome, or how in Rome, the film by Fellini, 1972, there is a character saying, you come to Rome to die, I think that you know it's all coming sort of together. So this is another little gem that I wanted to bring in. But whether you know the emotion about either death or Rome, or either Italy or Rome or death, or all together, it's not just coming from, say, the Italian side of the conversation, but also think about something like Madame de Stel, uh, Corinne, or Italy. Already, you know, they, once again, we're bringing in the female and the character, the country and the person, the persona, and the exploration around the femininity of Corinne, which is very, or who is very mysterious in the story. If you want, later on, we can go over the story so that perhaps we recover some of the sense of what I'm trying to say, but you know, said it really very briefly. The problem there is that we need to establish the identity of Corinne as we discover Italy, and the two become conjoined from the perspective of an author who is very keen to be apologetic, i.e., writing you know positively about Italy at the very moment in which discussion and discourse over Italy is very negative. This book came out in 1807, and it was one of the first and very major romantic novels of European literature. And as such, it has marked, once again, you know, discourse on Italy. Now, this book comes from someone who is not Italian, and it is pouring out emotions regarding <coughs> the country at the very moment in which, in order to save the argument, Corinne is also to be found out not to be entirely Italian. And that's interesting, because she is too much of a positive to be entirely Italian, because we don't want an entirely positive Italian. Let's be careful about that. I think that that's also part of the problem. And the novel is set in Rome. So Rome, Corinne, Italy are all woven together. I mean, it's so, there is so much building up. There is so much expectation on both parties. In the uh, book by Madame de Stel, the protagonist, who is called, um, supposed to be coming from England, but in reality is coming from Scotland, is a Scottish laird, is a Scottish aristocrat, has got all the mystery of the northerly man, but he's also got all the suspicion regarding that passionate woman, that passionate Roman woman, who turns out to be not Roman at all, Corinne, that you know, it all waves in or feeds into this kind of discourse on Italy, you know, that Italy is the country that we both love and suspect as being far too strong for our taking and liking. And here it comes to Sacro Gra. Sacro Gra, it's an interesting film, less well known than uh, Great Beauty. Possibly meant for a similar kind of audience, though. It's supposed to be a documentary. 
uh, documentary film. It's sung by, as the poster says, by Gianfranco Rosi as the author, the director. But at the same time, the authorship is co-shared ultimately with the actors. The actors are not actors, they are not professionals, they are themselves. And apparently Gianfranco Rosi has worked for something like over a year in order to be so close to these actors, to be so attuned uh, to their mentality, so as to bring the best out of their, if you want, their personal story. Now, why the Sacro Gra? As we know, Gra is il grande raccordo annulare. It's the most important motorway system, uh, orbital motorway system around Rome. It's a kind of uh, tangential. And it was built over time, starting in 1948, by Eugenio Gra. So for once, we've got something of a joke of destiny, ultimately. It could have been an acronym. In reality, this is an eponym. Gra is the name of, you know, the, if you want, the author of uh, the project. At the same time, it's also what the thing itself is. Grande Raccordo Anulare. It is supposed to be nearly perfectly circular. It is not from the map, as we see it. It was supposed to be nearly equidistant from the center. Interestingly, why? Why do we, do we bother to have something as geometrical as that? After all, it has got to be useful. It has got to deliver, you know, convenience, mobility, not particularly, you know, geometry. But it's interesting that that was one of the aspirations. One could go technical and describe it in some way, you know, there are 42 exits, uh, there are so many tunnels, and so on and so forth. It's an, an interesting concept. It is a fascinating road. It's an additional level or layering of walls. Rome has got, you know, has had walls and still has the Aurelian walls. Certainly this is an additional immaterial wall that was set up in order to do what? Now they say that in order to keep out what? The Sacro Gra, no, sorry, the Gra was trying to keep out of Rome uh, so many years ago would need to be 110 kilometers wide or long. Uh, and that means that, you know, in order to keep out something, what is the something that we want to give up? Actually, it would have to be a lot bigger. That is the, if you want, the thing out there. But what about the film? In the film, you do have something coming to town, something pointed onto the town. The poster is quite actually graphic in a way, even though you wouldn't be, as a human, particularly worried about this particular insect, but you can be worried in symbolic terms if you are, you know, in some other realm, i.e., this is the red weevil. Uh, the red weevil is part of the story. It's pointed onto Rome. It's almost like a vector pointed onto Rome. It's already half inside the protective circle, and it's still partly the body hanging outside. Of all the stories that converge in this film, Rosie, or the team behind Rosie, have decided to go for the particular story of the palmologo, the guy who is fighting the lost battle of protecting Rome, whether inside the circle or outside the circle, from this threatening threat, the threat of the red weevil. The stories are many, and they come back more than once. Again, on the surface of things, this is a story generated by the fact that uh, Sacro, um, Gianfranco Rosi, in his interest for real stories out there, works with people, has decided to work with people living on the Gra, and uh, having identified interesting story for his purpose, has woven them together in an episodic fashion. They come and go, they come and go. But what, can there be a subtext there? And can there be one that is of interest to us? Once again, a bit as we did with the uh, Grande Bellezza. If we look at the stories, well, the leading ones are one about a nurse, a, an ambulance driver. Uh, he works night shifts on the Gra, and so you do see, you know, how he comes to basically the scene of accidents to uh, recover whatever there is to be recovered. He looks like, you know, someone sent from God at times, uh, rescuing lives and, you know, being available to his own personal distress. It's interesting that one of the few things that Rosie says about these characters, which are supposed to be themselves, I mean, these are people with, you know, they are named in the credits as themselves. Well, one of the things that he says about this particular guy, one of the 
I would say, one of the leading characters in the story is that he's like an astronaut. And indeed, once you start looking at the film from that perspective, you do see signature tunes reminding you of Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. And that, again, changing, changes the perspective over, if you want, what is supposed to be a series of stories to document what life on the ground is all about nowadays. It could be a documentary, but it's not. What are the other stories? Well, another interesting story, trying to keep things together, is about a fisherman. And this fisherman, and this is my next, uh, my next clip. The fisherman is basically fishing eels. He comes on scene a couple of times, and he's worried. He's worried about basically. is coming to town. It doesn't have subtitles, unfortunately. It's funny how I, um, there, isn't, there are no subtitles in this, uh, for this film. At least in the, in the edition I bought. Perhaps they have it in If you want, I can run through the... Le anguille tradizionalmente si pescano e si consumano d'inverno, giusto? Cioè, quando si erano già nei prodotti, ma chi ha detto, se queste vanno a fare in produzione fatti di sargassi, come faccio a mangiare meglio di una tranquilla che ha già riprodotto? La torna a pescare in mangiare di sargassi? Eh, questo, questo è stato una stupidità generosa. Ancora una volta si sposta su chi acquista cari, cari cittadini il nostro 30% di terra per un funzionario. Ma va a campare a parte, no? Ma va a passeggiare. E poi una stupidità ci dite. Io ho buttato via tutto e te saluto. Siamo in mano a prova gente che ce ne rischia tutto e pochissimo. Però a noi che siamo una vita dentro l'altro non ci interpretano mai, non porta mai nessuno. Vedo che Che dici, eh? va bene così. Andiamo avanti, mi scelgo. Andiamo avanti, Take of some kind 
of a certain kind of Italy that is very much loved, once again, humane, you know, the humble, but positive. You know, there is something about this Italy that is endearing, however messy, however uncitizen-like. Some of the things that he is saying also, I don't know, I can go into them if, you know, because of the A, the sound, which wasn't happy, the volume wasn't high enough, and B, the lack of uh, subtitles. You know, here you have someone who is very much afraid of what is reading in the papers. His livelihood is about fishing. The paper is all about, and that's already it's a bit strange. You know, the paper is taking, taken up one entire page by problems with eels. I think that Rosie here is playing. And the ultimate result is extremely, you know, unrealistic, pushing the boundaries of what can be taken as documentary, what is instead really Rosie takes it. Rosie fetch it like Gra, Eugenio Gra fetch it that particular road, i.e. there is a signature here that is fairly strong. And indeed, many people who do work in the business of making real documentaries are saying this is not a documentary at all. This is somebody's very strong vision of you know, a message that is about Rome and Italy. At the same time, it's packaged in such a way as to be passed as a docu-film, i.e. as a documentary film, which it is not. So, using the anonymity, if you want, the trick of the non-professional author, something is put across that is very personal. And in being very personal, it's once again hitting on some of the hard truths and continuities, if you want, of a discourse on Italy, which is, can be either generated by us or from outside. And what are these things? We don't need now. They, I think I can go, perhaps now it will be explored, but it doesn't matter. Um, the issue about the eels, <coughs> however, you know, overplayed in the papers, is that they are coming. New eels are being brought into our waters, a bit like the red weevil. Now, the red weevil may be and is a real threat. Perhaps eels are a threat. What we're talking about here is, if you want to extend it metaphorically to what we've been talking so far, is that there is an idea of Rome that we need, an idea of Italy that we need. We protect it with walls, with immaterial roots, with circles of whatever kind. The arrow of time, of time goes through it regardless. So it is penetrating, and it is affecting what happens within. But still, we try to protect it. In trying to protect it, we are revealing some of our fears and some of our continuities, as I was saying before. And if you want, if you can think, if we want to think that Sacro Gra must mean something like the Holy Grail, and if we're thinking this is a fisherman, could we think that this is a fisher king? And that somehow, you know, the Italy that is being depicted through night prostitutes, nurses of the night who are astronauts as if they were flying into outer space on the odyssey, you know, into the furthest distance of the cosmos, if all of this can become a universal and at the same, at the same time retain its specificity as a discourse on Italy, I think we're hitting on something. Isn't Rose perhaps saying something about, you know, the vulnerability, the fact that our king supposedly is diseased and that the land, the land that is being depicted as part of Sacro Gra, as marked, made sacred as in a state of exception, i.e. excluded from everything else. I mean, it is in itself diseased, and we can only save it if something like what? Like Percival comes along, and hence another individual leader, another savior. Hasn't Italy got the savioral syndrome that repeats itself all the time, inevitably? Isn't it perhaps this is one of the main <coughs> problems it has been discussed historically, philosophically, politically, but isn't it always coming up, surfacing up through whatever we do, even at this level? Perhaps I'm pushing here. I don't think so, because Rose has given us some clues as to the fact that he's pushing the boundaries of the documentary towards you know, the timelessness, the transpassing into something other and else. If you watch the film or if you've watched it, I think you perceive it, how much he plays on the time dimension. Time flows, 
and it flows circularly because you know 160,000 cars go onto that sacro gra every day, sorry, gra every day. And that motion is relentless, time does not stop. But in that, we can create, as I said, the continuities that are the discontinuities which allow us to see what we stand for. And what we stand for is this disease that can only be cured if someone will come out, will come in and rescue us. Now, I'll close with last few comments. At Harvard, I'm teaching a course that is called Italy, the Seven Deadly Sins. I thought it was a bit daring when I proposed it. And people really took to it, and I'm really pleased. It's an exploration that is going on and will last in time semester. <coughs> now, I will just, as a way to say thank you for coming, and hopefully see you again, and I hope that you've enjoyed this talk, and that there will be plenty of questions at the end. I'll just tell you what the sins are. I thought that they had to be outrageous, and they had to be absolutely rigorous. So here they are. Beauty, distinction, genius, heart, stamina, mobility, voice. There are seven, and we sing by all of them. Thank you. So it came in bits and pieces, episodic, and with returns. And I'm really happy to take any questions on, on many of the provocations that I've thrown around. There are several. And obviously, you know, it requires building more together or separately individually on some of them. These were just suggestions. Um, but I think there are sort of strong undercurrents that can unite some of the things that I've said. Ready for the firing. Can you suggest some reading on Rome by I Romani? By Romani? Why do we want to have readings by Romani personally? <laughs> Not insiders. Insiders, we want insiders. I don't know, it could be something like the canon. Do we want the canon? I don't want to sound, oh, that's great. I don't, I don't want to sound, you know, um, too obvious. But I would still go back to some of the, uh, if you want, canonical texts of the 20th century. Why not? Uh, one favorite book of mine, if I may push on the non-Romano who came to Rome, though, and does deserve a place on the, you know, really on the altar, if you want, would be Carlo Emilio Garda col pasticciaccio, may I suggest that? Because that, to me, is a good take on Rome, a particularly sensitive one, in the sense, you know, it comes from someone who not just tried to understand Rome, but did really uh, lived it through his body, his messy body. Mm -hmm. So, because his work is so much uh, taken by the substance of being embodied, Rome was a great encounter for him, mm -hmm. and so I would say, and not by chance, I mean, in uh, Via Merulana there is now a plaque to, to him saying, you know, this is the road that inspired Carlo Migliogada to write Corpo di Ciaccio Brutto di Merulana. That would be one. Uh, and I'm not, about those who have come to Rome, uh, I'm not particularly enthusiastic. It's not answering your question, but um, I'm not, and again, I'm opening discussion on this one, perhaps. I'm not particularly enthusiastic about um, scontro di civiltà. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you think. Mm -hmm. um, again, if that is you know, thinking about Rome from a perspective of the non-Roman, at the same time trying to say something <coughs> about that civilization. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled here because I, I cannot think of something that really takes my fancy at the moment. I'm thinking <coughs> of films mm. rather than of. And actually, you know, Sorrentino comes from Naples, Rosie comes from uh, Eritrea. Mm -hmm. So n not even they are locals. It's very difficult. That's a, a very good point, even though there is obviously um, a lot that is being by people who are active in Rome nowadays, including those who are. Uh, let's say brought up as Italians but originally not from Italy um, actually Rome is in itself 
almost in a, a welcoming empty shell. Mm. So many people have brought something to Rome, and you've got to ask whether the art, the art, the art, sorry, the, the, the craft that we see around Rome is actually can be described as Roman. Mm. Um, it's actually a city that invites cosmopolitanism and in coming to it to become then provincialized by Rome. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if that's a good question. Uh, okay. Answer it all. Yes. Um, <coughs> so uh, I'm co teaching a seminar uh, on um, language and politics, and we're going, we're looking at some topoi and tropes that go from really like Machiavelli or mm. even Petrarca to the current day. Mm -hmm. and, um, so we've we've seen this kind of um, you know this, this classical this classical kind of foreigner's view on Italy, right? Which I, I personally did not like. Girlfriend in a coma. I, I had a problem. I'm pleased to hear that. I had big problems yeah. with it. So, yeah. but it's typical in in and you brought out you know the kind of that Italy is the fallen. It's this and this and needs the, the mm -hmm. foreign. Okay. So there's that whole discourse which is old, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and then there is the discourse that's generated by Italians, the autocritica. Yeah. And I'm just curious, and these, this is also old, right? And I'm curious of your view, this is a macro question, it's, it's macro not question. to do with yeah. Rome in particular, yeah, yeah. although you're right to say sometimes... There is a double bind, it's difficult to say. Right, them. right. Yeah. So what, is there a dynamic, you know, is it that, that foreigners, foreigners make these observations and Italians internalize them? Italians are making them independently because we can date some of them, as we've seen in the yeah. class, way, way, like way, way before way. the foreign grand mm. tour. So I'm curious if you have a sense of... This is a phenomenal question. I know, it's huge. It's like it's asking, like you know, who comes first, the yeah. chicken or the egg. Yes, I mean, it's, it it's, it's really <laughs> next to it being possible <laughs> to answer it with, you know, precision. Yeah. But I think that the circulation is phenomenal <coughs> in its continuity yeah. and you said you know Machiavelli and I, I, I like to in, in my kind of approach given my um, expertise I tend to, to work between Machiavelli and Gramsci and what you see in between mm -hmm. these two uh, giants you see that actually from the Italian side of the argument you know it's it's there it's inevitable it is painful it is causing mistakes argumentative mistakes starting from Machiavelli upwards uh, to get to Gramsci where he has got to say you know perhaps Italy is not fit for parliamentarism you know you have got to to, to, to come with the come up with the oddest almost kind of justifications in order to say perhaps Italy is really not fit for modernity and at the same time Machiavelli upwards there is this inevitable expectation, the messianic expectation you know, that someone like the prince, singular, will come out of the mushrooming of princes, you know, there are princes everywhere <laughs> coming up in the prince, uh, <coughs> and obviously they all come and fail, but perhaps out of these one, not Cesare Borgia because he's dead by now, but you know, someone may come up and finally, finally take us somewhere. At the same time, at the other end, Gramsci having witnessed what happens between Machiavelli and himself, he has got to say, you know, that actually even that expectation fails, i.e. that Italy is congenitally, I think I'm, I'm not misquoting here, is congenitally unable to produce and sustain, you know, the lasting prince, if we, if we want to use the Machiavellian term. Now, in all of this, there is a lot of contact. The contact comes in so many ways, you know, th through trade, through cultural mobility. <coughs> think about the um, Commedia dell'arte, uh, artists traveling Europe being kicked in and out of courts depending on the favor of the particular king. Think about the reformation, think about the counter-reformation, think about all that goes into basically taking a position on a number of issues that boil down also as being identified as Italy. And it's really difficult to say they, we are rightly blamed as being, you know, with a chip on the shoulder, always ready to take offense, always ready to feel persecuted by, you know, fate. And for instance, when uh, the predecessor of Cinecittà, now I can't remember the name, but there was a predecessor of, pre of Cinecittà burnt down, and that's how Cinecittà came into being, basically the, the, the chair, uh, the chairperson of the burnt down institution was saying, hey, Italians are persecuted by fate. Well, you know, 
let's stop a minute. Is there something that we can remedy there? But it's certainly part and parcel of the configuration. And I think that you, when you present yourself to the table, to the international table, with this kind of argument, you're bound to arise. And if I may say so, the hmm, no, I I don't I cannot say that. But especially because we are on film. But let's say you do get the kind of response you know, that you do get from Bill Emmett in that film. <coughs> I don't think it's entirely balanced. He's going to, in a sense, the kind of banquet, you know, we've made it for him. And the most amazing thing in that film for me is that in the early scenes when he's setting up the narrative, the meta-narrative about how the film came about, he says, you know, I was going around Italy asking or telling people, look, I'm going to make a film about, yeah. etc. And he told me, Oh, go ahead, I don't mind. That is the damning point, because we should mind. That's a point where in the negotiation or in the conversation or in the discussion, there is something that is very weak. So again, I don't know if the enslavement to Rome, if I may go as, back to, as far back as that, as a metaphor, I think it works. Perhaps it's technically not correct, but I like to play on the, if you want, rhetorical tag that uh, Il Canto degli Italiani or L'Inno Nazionale uh, allows me to play on. Uh, basically, that enslavement has really worked deep in the Italian psyche, if you can call it Italian psyche at any level, given that this chip on the shoulder travels again into other local aspects of our culture that have got nothing to do with being Italian also. We are amazing travelers of the world. We are amazingly successful when it comes to you know, integrating elsewhere. And yet we fail on that one issue so terribly and so sadly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for your attention. And I've really enjoyed myself a lot. And thank you for your hospitality. And good luck to you all. And take care on your journey home. <coughs> <coughs>